Marianne Groven back with us. Uh, she's still in a boot cast, but we always uh, keep her in our prayers, and we're just grateful that she could be back here still playing, uh, limping a little bit, but uh, she's got... Uh, she looks great. So obviously the prayers that you've been offering for her uh, have been heard by our Lord, and she's healing and recovering nicely. So good to have you here. Also, uh, uh, want to let you know that today the cross was installed, and so tomorrow on my 431, I'll be putting a picture of that with a sign in the driveway. You saw a couple of pictures that Don put up there tonight. So things are happening on the church land. The uh, implementation team is meeting tomorrow evening uh, to clarify a few things. And uh, hopefully then, by the time we have our Emmanuel huddle on December 4th, uh, we'll be able to give you all kinds of wonderful celebration updates, okay? So that's our hope and our prayer. Discipleship membership covenants. Uh, we start officially with our new church here, which is next Saturday, Advent 1. Uh, today is Christ the King, and that means it's New Year's Eve in the life of the church. But we've already gotten 19 covenants in, so some people, they want to jump on board right away. They don't want to wait until the first day, and that's okay. Uh, so don't forget that membership here at Emmanuel is all about discipleship, and that we sign or re-up once a year then with the discipleship covenant, okay? Uh, you can ask questions about that. There's uh, covenants back there on the table as well. Don't forget that this coming Wednesday, We'll be having a Thanksgiving Eve service here during the day at 2 p.m. In the morning, there'll be a service at 11 a.m., but that'll be for the residents of Madonna Towers. Thanksgiving offering every year is designated uh, for the pastor's discretionary fund. That's not a budgeted item, so please keep that in mind with your tithes and your offerings as well. And then next week, remember, I'll have an Advent gift for you, the littlest watchman, one per family. And so you can read about that in the newsletter as well, but it's a, a discipline that we're going to have this year during the season of Advent. And every day in my 431, I'll be providing a devotional thought based upon this particular book. Thrivent Choice Dollars. We found out this past week that uh, Julie said, oh, I've got some dollars. I didn't know I had them. If you have any Thrivent products, make sure that you call that number once in a while or that you go online. I had about $80 that I didn't even know about. And so... Those are dollars that also help us to advance the work of God in his kingdom here in Rochester and at Emmanuel Lutheran. So lots of announcements in your bulletin, and I encourage you to please take note of those as well. Let us begin our service then with our confession and forgiveness, and that's printed in your bulletin or will be up on the screen. We worship as we live in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, let us be reconciled to God and to one another. Gracious God, have mercy, mercy on, on us. us. In, in your, your compassion, compassion forgive, forgive us our, our sins, sins, known and unknown, things, things done, done and left undone. Uphold us by your Spirit, spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Crown him with many crowns. Please rise as you are able.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also, also with, with you. you. Our hymn of praise, Glory to God, Women, Part 1, and Men, Part 2. be with you and, and also, also with, with you. you let us pray sovereign lord at the end of time your eternal reign will be fully revealed and all will stand in awe of your son jesus the king of kings as we gather in your holy presence nourish us with word bread and wine that we may go forth making that reign known through jesus christ our lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the hearing of God's word.
Our first lesson is from Daniel chapter 7, beginning with verse 9. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Our psalm is Psalm 93. We'll read it responsively. The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord, Lord is, is robed. He, he has put, put on, on strength, strength as, as his belt. belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your, Your throne, throne is established, established from, from of old. You, you are, are from, from everlasting. everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters. Mightier, Mightier than, than the, the waves, waves of the, the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Our second lesson is from Revelation chapter 1. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. The Gospel according to St. John, the 18th chapter. Glory, Glory to, you, to you, O Lord. O Lord. You'll notice that as I read the Gospel reading for tonight, it's from the Passion narrative in John's Gospel. And so I want to back up and share a few verses before it and a few verses after it, because it's all about being on trial. It's all about interrogation. A reading from John, chapter 18. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken, to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again, and he called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, 
Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O oh Christ. Christ. Congregation may be seated. When one finds themselves in a courtroom where there is a trial going on, there is usually a judge, there's usually a jury, there's a prosecutor, there's a defense attorney. What we see going on in John chapter 18 is a trial scene. So the question naturally is, who's on trial? And there are lots of questions, interrogations, that are being asked first by Caiaphas and Annas when Jesus is on trial before them, and now by Pontius Pilate, the Roman curator, the judge in Palestine, the one who gets to call the shots, the one supposedly who is, well, the judge in charge, the boss. So who's on trial? Because on the surface, it appears that Jesus is the one who's on trial. And he's the one that's being asked question. But if we take a second look, a deeper look at our gospel reading for tonight on this Christ the King celebration, we find out that Annas and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin and the Jewish leaders and the people of God and Pilate himself is the one that's on trial. And Jesus is the one who asks the most important questions. And Jesus is the one who, as we confess in our creed, is the judge of the living and the dead. In the book of Revelation, in our epistle reading, if you will, for tonight, we hear these words. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Grace and peace to you from Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the dead, the faithful witness, the ruler of the kings of the earth. He holds in his hands the keys to death and to Hades. He is, in the words of one of our hymns for tonight, the potentate of time. And that means that the past, the present, and the future are all governed by his decree, his sovereignty, his lordship, his kingship. King of kings and lord of lords. Everyone is going to be on trial. Everyone is going to receive a judgment. Everyone is going to make a confession. You probably heard that phrase in the past. If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you and I were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict us? So who's on trial? Who's asking the questions? And most importantly, who is the answer? Because the last question that Pilate asks is, what is truth? 
He's standing face to face with Jesus Christ the ruler of the kings of the earth, face to face with the one who in John chapter 14 has already said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now it's important to recognize what Jesus has said because the definite article the is found in the Greek New Testament text. You don't need to have it there. The fact that it is there, though, indicates something of profound truth. That Jesus is not just a way. That Jesus is not one of many truths. That Jesus is not just one path of life out of a million other options. But he is the way, the truth, the life. The firstborn of the dead. The faithful witness. In fact, you heard in the interrogation that's going on, this conversation between Jesus and Pilate, where Jesus says, you say that I'm a king. That's why I was born. That's why I came into the world, Jesus said. To bear witness to the truth. To testify. To proclaim the truth. Literally, through the incarnation, he embodies the truth. For he is the truth. And apart from him, there's only the father of all lies. Satan himself. So, being on trial as followers of Christ, it's important for you and for me to ask ourselves, what's the evidence? What's the evidence that convicts us of the charge that we are, in fact, redeemed through the blood of the Lamb. The Lamb who is slain and has begun his reign. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Did you recognize the name George Frederick Handel? You know, if you've been somewhat acquainted with music, I'm guessing you recognize the name Handel. George Frederick Handel. Born in Halle, Germany, uh, 1685, died at the age of 74, 1759, a phenomenal, gifted by God musician, and probably best known for what? The Messiah and the Hallelujah Chorus. It's an interesting life that he lived, having been born and raised in this city of pietism. That's what Halle, Germany was. Lots of profound universities, schools, orphanages. People cared about the poor, and they wanted to make sure that those who claimed the name Christian were actually practicing their faith in day-to-day -day life. That's the environment that Handel was raised in. And as a gifted by God musician, he used all of those gifts to create operas and oratorios that were biblically grounded. He used music to tell, to testify, to proclaim the story of God's gift of salvation in the one who is king of kings, Jesus the Christ. Now, when he went to London, Handel met a man by the name of Jennings. Charles Jennings was gifted, if you will, biblically, and also gifted financially. Uh, he was a very generous man. And so he and Handel uh, started an opera company, and they started putting scripture to music with these operas. But the church establishment... You know, the Caiaphas is the Annases, uh, the Sanhedrin. The church establishment didn't like that, and so they kind of preached against Handel. And eventually, eventually, I think it was 1737, he went bankrupt, he and Jennings, on their opera company. At about this time, uh, he was facing having to go into what was called the debtor's prison. And he had had a minor stroke. He was battling depression. 
uh, he was at a crisis point, if you will. And then it, suddenly in 1741, as God's providence would have it, two letters came in the mail simultaneously to him, and one was from Jennings, who said, I've accumulated all of these texts that God has given me about the messianic prophecies of Jesus the Christ. I want you to use the gift that God has given you and to use these texts, and I want you to create an oratorio on the divinity of the Christ. Well, he got another letter from Dublin, Ireland, and it was from an admirer, a musical admirer, who said, we've got a lot of poverty here, and God has laid it on my heart that he wants you to write an oratorio, and that we can then have it performed, and it can be used as a fundraiser to help get men out of the debtor's prison and to fund the hospitals here. Well, Handel said yes to that. For 24 days straight, George Frederick Handel immersed himself entirely in scripture and in prayer and in composition. And when someone came in to check on him, a friend, they said he was emotionally and physically exhausted. But there was a glow about him. And Handel said, I've seen the throne room of God Almighty. Revelation chapter 5. I've seen the Lamb who is slain and has begun his reign. Hallelujah. Well, that's when he was composing the Hallelujah Chorus. Uh, did you know that in the Hallelujah Chorus, and he shall reign forever and ever, King of kings, Lord of lords, Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. Right, I mean, you've sung it before. I, a lot of you in here have sung it, right? 47 times, Hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. What else can we do when we've seen the throne room of Almighty God? when we've come to realize that all these other fake imposter kings, people, things that we put on the throne of our lives here on earth are all temporal. They're all going to perish. There's only one who is, who was, and who is to come. The firstborn of the dead. That means there'll be a second, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth, and a seventh, and a eighth. You see? He's got the keys to death and Hades in his hand. George Frederick Hendel credited the entire composition that God had created entirely to his Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I can take no credit for this. So you know how he ended it, right? S-G-D, S-D-G, sole deo gloria, to God alone the glory. And when he died, interestingly enough, on Holy Saturday, right between Good Friday and Easter morning, hallelujah, on his tombstone, grave marker, the words, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know. His testimony, his proclamation, Jesus says to Pilate, that's why I came into the world. That's why I was born. It's a different kind of kingship. You know it as well as I do, because we expect that King Jesus is going to be born, well, in a palace. And Samia knows she's been there. That grotto, the church of the nativity, the place of our Lord. He was born in a stable, and he wasn't laid in an ivory crib. This king of all kings was laid in a feed box 
for animals. And on the cross, he's enthroned. That's his throne on a good Friday. And the scepter is hyssop and a sponge. The Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world. It's not what we would expect. That's why Pilate can be standing right there in front of Jesus, face to face, and not be able to see the truth, the way, the life. In John chapter 10, Jesus uses the metaphor that we find throughout Scripture. The metaphor for a king is a shepherd. And in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. They know his voice and they follow him. And no one, no one can snatch one of my lambs out of my hands. This is the truth, Jesus says. You have God's word on it. But we live in a time, as you know, where people prefer a different way, a different path. Individual, autonomy, everything's relative. Everything is my subjective opinion. We live in a time where people disavow the certainty of Scripture when it proclaims the truth, the absolute truth. There are some who would say there are no absolutes. What you are sharing with me is simply your opinion. Well, but what about the law of gravity? What goes up must come down. I believe that that is your opinion. And I will respect that, Pastor Dave. But for me to believe it means that I must personally put it to the test. So I'm going to go on that tall building over there and jump off so that I can prove to you that there is no absolute. Well, it won't take long for him to discover that the law of gravity will hold to be true. You know the quote by Abraham Lincoln, when he was dealing with people that were having trouble with logic. And he said to them, I mean, even in Lincoln's time, you had a lot of this autonomous subjectivism, right? Everything's relative. Lincoln looked at some people and he said, let me ask you a question. A sheep has how many legs? How many? Oh, four. Lincoln said, you're correct. Good observation. And what if, suppose, suppose we were to call the tail a leg. Suppose that we were to call the tail a leg. Now, how many legs does the sheep have? Or just because somebody calls a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. You see what Abraham Lincoln was trying to help people see? There are absolutes. And those absolutes become a matter of life and death in the present as well as the future. Everyone's going to have someone or something on their throne. It might be their job, it might be their spouse, it might be their parents, it might be their kids. I don't know what's going to be on your throne. I know that cancer is not going to be on my throne because it's already occupied by the one who is, who was, and who will be. That's what I know. I know, in the words of Handel, my Redeemer lives. And I believe that that is an absolute truth because Jesus is the way, 
And he is the truth. And he is the life. And that's a promise for eternity. This past week, I came upon a story. I, I put some of it into the 431. I, I'm not big in following Christian rock bands. Maybe some of you are. But this is very interesting. A man by the name of John Cooper, for 23 years, traveled around the world in a band called Skillet, a Christian rock band. And they would be the opening act for some extremely gifted, important groups. Well, he did that for 23 years. And then recently, he self-published a book because to do it through one of the major publishing houses meant that they wanted him to edit his work significantly and getting rid of all the Jesus language, the Bible language. So he self-published it. It's called Awake and Arise to Truth. Very fitting, I think, in light of our scriptural readings for tonight and our celebration of the reign of Christ. Awake and arise to truth. The truth. Finding the truth in a relativistic world. Now, John Cooper has an interesting story. When he was five years old, Jesus appeared to him in his bedroom. Five years old. He went downstairs because he was kind of, well, disturbed, frightened by this. He told his mom and dad, and they said, you're just procrastinating because you don't want to go to bed. You get up there right now, and you go to bed. None of this nonsense. He went back up to his bedroom. And then God appeared to him a second time. And he said to John Cooper, you need to give your heart entirely to Jesus Christ. John Cooper said, that's what I did when I was five years old. Up in my bedroom. When my mom and dad thought I was just procrastinating from going to bed. I gave my heart to Jesus and I said, you're going to be my boss. You're going to rule my life. You're going to be my king. When John Cooper was in his teens, he struggled. His mother battled cancer for three years and then died. His faith was put to the test. But through it all, through it all, he clung to the vision that God had given him. That Jesus was and is and always will be the way, the truth, and the life. In 2011, when he was playing for the Christian rock band Skillet, when they hadn't sold quite 12 million copies of their music yet, at the end of one of the evening concerts, a gentleman approached John Cooper and said, you and your band are amazing. The best I've heard anywhere. This man was a mover and a shaker. He said, you know, you could, instead of opening acts for others, you could be the number one band in the whole world. And I kid you not. There's just one problem. You've got to stop doing all these Christian concerts. You've got to stop doing all of these radio Christian interviews. And you've got to stop talking about Jesus at all of your concerts and in your music. Because if you do, I can guarantee you, you are going to make a ton of money. And just think, you care about the poor. Just think about all the poor that you can take care of and help. John said, I went home and I talked to my wife, Corey. We didn't have to talk long. Two or three seconds at the most. And she said, is this guy serious? And John Cooper said, 
we both knew that a promise had been made years and years before. We knew who the King of Kings is, was, and always will be. And we were not about to exchange him. You see, that's why he recently wrote this book. Awake and arise to truth. Awake and arise to the name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess, Jesus is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. There was a little boy, maybe 12, 14, somewhere in there. He was the witness of a crime. And so, of course, there was a trial. And this young boy then was brought in, and he was put on the stand to bear testimony. Now, the lawyer was a good lawyer in the sense of he knew how to get criminals off. <laughs> and so, the lawyer, when he sees this young boy on the stand, he says, I need to ask you some questions, son. First of all, has anyone told you what to say on this stand today? And the boy said, yes. And then the lawyer said, and who told you what to say? The boy said, my father. And the lawyer started to grin from ear to ear. He said, I have another question. Son, what did your father tell you to say? And the boy replied, my father told me that there would probably be a sleazy lawyer that would try to trip me up. So my father told me, you just tell the truth and everything will be fine. You just tell the truth. And everything, everything will be fine. Everything. Grace and peace to you from he who is, who was, and who is to come again. Grace and peace to you from the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead the ruler of the kings of the earth. And he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah! 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 Well, I won't do it 47 times, but in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I invite you to rise as you are able for our hymn of the day, soon and very soon. Okay. 
continue with our confession of faith. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sisters and brothers, rejoice, mend your ways, encourage one another, agree with one another, live in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. And as you are able tonight and in the days ahead, share the peace of Christ the King with others. You may be seated. Our communion hymn, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper this day, is Immortal Invisible. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, surrounded by evil and bordered by death, we appeal to you, our sovereign, our wisdom, our potentate of time, and our judge. We praise you for Christ, who proclaimed your reign of peace and promised an end to injustice and harm. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, the sacrifice of his life and death and the victory of his resurrection, we await with all the saints his loving redemption of our suffering world. Send your spirit on these gifts of bread and wine and on all who share in the body and blood of your Son. Teach us your mercy and justice and make all things new in Christ. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now I invite you to take your consecrated bread and wine. Take the bread first, peel the label off. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. And then we take the label off of the side with the wine. This is the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. We rise for the table blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We continue with our closing prayers. Let us intercede before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for the sake of the church, the world, and one another. Father, though the eyes made blind by sin, thy glory may not see. Even so, give us eyes to see Jesus. Give us ears to hear his word of truth resounding in halls of power. Give us lips to proclaim him as Savior and King of the universe. Give us hearts to adore him. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You have made your Son King of creation and head of your holy church. Bind the church to Christ with cords of love. Make it unswerving in faith, radiant in holiness, and bold in witness. Use it to draw all people to his cross, there to acclaim him as Lord, King, and Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You have made your Son our Savior and Lord. Fill the people of this congregation with your Holy Spirit so that in all we say and do among all people we encounter, we acclaim Jesus Christ as Son of God and Son of Man. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. You have made your Son Lord of the nations. By your Holy Spirit, conform the hearts of rulers and people to the heart of Christ, and let his peace reign in every land. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. You have made your son fairer than woodlands, meadows, and flowers of blooming spring. Let this beauty, healing, and compassion cause all sorrowing hearts to sing. Especially this day we pray for the needs of those we name. Gracious Lord, we ask for your mercy for Randy and Cindy Lund, for Sheldon Bieri, for Sis Brayton, for Barb Stephenson, for Margaret Quam and Elaine Jacobson, for Darren and Deb Colon, for Don Wanick, for Marianne Groven, for Nakia Ryder and her family, for Eric Miller and Deb Spitzer, for Melody Graves, Ariana Pananen, Karen Otis. We pray also for Ashley and for Tyler. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. Most gracious Father, you have made your Son to shine more brightly than the angels of heaven. We thank you for the lives of the faithful departed who already see his glory face to face. Fill us with such faith and love that in your good time we shall join them in heavenly glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. For Jesus' sake, dear Father, Graciously hear and answer our fervent petitions to your glory and for the blessing of others. Amen. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We sing together, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Bring
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be, be to God. God.